Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire and motivate, and people who can educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Christine Handy. She is a best selling author of her book, Walk Beside Me Mom of Two Boys, Breast Cancer Survivor, Thriver, and Disruptor. Motivational speaker around the globe, self-esteem expert, national and international model, humanitarian, Fox Radio and TV guest speaker on breast cancer and women's issues, board member of eBeauty, a national charitable wig exchange program for those who cannot afford wigs during their cancer treatment, senior ambassador for Learn, Look, Locate, a global outreach to help educate and empower women about critical information regarding their breast health board member of People of Purpose and a Harvard student pursuing a master's degree in creative writing and literature. Welcome, Christine, to the podcast. It's an honor to have you here, and I really appreciate the courage it takes uh, to publicly share your story. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, it's our honor. Let's start at the beginning, Christine. Tell us uh, where where you grew up and when did you start modeling and uh, was it your idea to model? Yes, it was my idea. Actually, I had to push hard in my with my family, my parents. I started modeling when I was 11, and I grew up in St. Louis. Born in Chicago, but grew up in St. Louis. So what was life like as a child model? Was there a lot of uh, pressure on you to perform well, and how did that affect you? Yeah, I mean, I think the industry is a performance-based industry, and it's also very transactional, which I soon found out. Not maybe necessarily at 11, but definitely well into my teens, I realized it was very transactional, meaning like uh, if a photographer would say, well, you know, if you do this for me, for this client, then I'll do this for you and get you a different client. And so I kind of thought the whole world worked that way because that's all I knew at a young age. And so by the time I was, you know, modeling in, you know, Spain and at 22, Um, that's just how I lived my life. It was very transactional. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that my life couldn't really be transactional anymore. It wasn't a way to live. Um, and yes, there was a lot of pressure as well, not only, um, personally, but for, for the most part on my physical appearance. And so we weren't allowed to cut our hair. We'd had to have the same hair color, hair cut. We had, we were weighed in. Now this is back many, many years. I'm this is 40 years ago. That would never happen now, but we were weighed in and there were um, a lot of rules. And so that's just kind of what I got used to. And I was always a rule follower. And so I was, I had a very strict regimen. I worked out, I, you know, I was very strict about my diet and that just, yeah, kind of how my life transformed. Well, take us up through your college years. Tell us about uh, your modeling career and your life after college. And what was your life like up to age 35? So in my college, so I ended up going to a college in Dallas because I wanted a bigger market, right? So I grew up in St. Louis and I worked, right. for, great, worked for a great agency called Talent Plus. And, and so by going to a bigger market, I had a bigger opportunities, right? right. And, so, and so throughout college, I was also modeling and, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do after college. But when I did graduate from college, that's immediately what I did. And I kept modeling and I actually didn't try to do anything else. And so, and so I continued my career and then I met a guy and I got married and at age 28, I had my first son. And then at age 30, I had my second son. And so, but throughout those years, even when I was three or four months pregnant with my first son, I wasn't showing at all. And I got this big campaign with just add water to do billboards for them. And I, and I still have the pictures of the billboards today and my flat, my stomach is completely flat. And I'm thinking wow. to myself, man, I was three months pregnant then. Um, but, you know, yeah. for, so while I was 35, that's, I, it was really one of the loves of my life, to be honest with you, was my career. And, you know, I would be considered a working model. It's still to this day, I would be considered a working model. Now you've talked about uh, self-esteem issues. Uh, what was that related to before your medical challenges, which we'll talk about in a little while, uh, one would assume models have a very high self-esteem. Oh, I have the best example of this. So this is how I see it. So if you walk into the room, into a room and there's the most beautiful woman or the most handsome guy, 
Yeah. Typically, typically somebody doesn't walk up to that person because they might feel intimidated or they might be, you know, a little bit uns unsure of that person's pride, ego, and whether they sure. would want somebody to walk up to them. And I feel that way with my group of friends who I've modeled with even back then or now. And we were always the person that people didn't come up to. And so not only is your self-esteem being questioned when you walk into the modeling agency and you're being measured and weighed and, and you know, you, sometimes I would go on jobs and the, the photographer or the client would say, you know, she's, she's just not the right look. And so there's right. this constant criticism, right? But based on complete external, it had nothing to do with, you know, who you were inside. Sure. And so that constant criticism, it takes a toll. And I didn't even realize it at the time. And so as these years were going by and I was still, you know, showing up for all these modeling jobs, I wasn't realizing that my self-esteem was kind of getting destroyed. And again, if you're one of the prettiest people in the room and people aren't coming up to you, that's another self-esteem disruptor, right? Sure. And, but again, you don't realize it because you think, well, you don't see yourself as the most pretty person in the room. You just see yourself as another person. Why aren't right. people coming up to me? Well, that's interesting because as a guy, we always thought maybe the pretty girls knew they were, you know, maybe they were pretty and all that. But yeah, that's that's interesting the way you you phrased it. Well, and then people automatically think that person is not only does have a self-assured and self uh, high self-esteem, but prideful and arrogant. Yeah. And quite literally the opposite. Yeah. Not for all models, but for the general population. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about. Uh, the life challenges you faced. Uh, can we talk about uh, the anorexia? Sure. So I had an eating disorder starting probably at like age 13. And it continued throughout my modeling career until at about 21. I It was controlling me. I thought I was in control with the, with the eating disorder. And by 21, it was controlling me. And so I went home from some, for summer from my SMU. I was between a sophomore and junior year at SMU. And I basically came home and said to my parents, this is a problem for me. And okay. I need to be hospitalized, which I was. And I stayed in the hospital for 30 days. And that really changed the, tra the trajectory of my life with my eating disorder. It really helped me. Yeah. And after that, I, after that, I didn't, I mean, I think you always have a, for me, I probably have a little bit of an issue, like long-term. I'm very, careful about what I eat, but I'm still modeling. Right. Right. Um, but in general, it can, it helps me a lot, but I needed that 30 days in the hospital to retrain myself. So everything seems to be going along swimmingly, but then we get to age 35 and stomach issues led to a colon resection. Can you please tell us about that whole story? Yeah. And so it's so interesting, right? So from the outside perspective, I look like I had this perfect life and, you know, inside I, I wasn't, and this is more an emotional part of it, but I was really lonely and I couldn't figure out why. And now I've obviously, I, if looking back, it's very obvious because my self-esteem was at a zero and I had a, a colon, I had a problem. I was having digestive issues and I finally went to see a colon doctor and he said, well, you have a, you have a twisted colon and we did not an emergency surgery. We didn't go into surgery that day, but a few days later, Right. what had happened was my colon, you know, just from, I was always very, very thin. And so when I carried babies and had babies in my stomach that stretched out my colon and we have a lot of excess colon, everybody does. Yeah. And, and so they said, we're just going to go in and ortho, ortho, Topically, you know, put little two little incisions in your hip where your hips are, and we're going to cut out a section of your colon. It's not that it wasn't a big deal surgery, but nobody said it was going to be this massive problem, which they didn't think it would. So I go into surgery and I come out of surgery in the, and I'm in the recovery room with a port in my neck with a blood bag of blood above my head. And I could, and I was in such intense pain and I, and I couldn't figure out why. Right. Right. And, and I felt cautiously felt down at my abdomen and I had, there were, st st there were staples, there were stitches from my hip to hip. And so what had happened during surgery was the doctor had nicked a vein in one of my bones. And because I was a model and he knew that I 
as a model. And I did a lot of lingerie and bathing suits. I was JC Penney's like every weekend I was in the paper for JC Penney. So I'm not talking about like Victoria's Secret. I'm talking about in the newspaper, right. on TV, in catalogs. I'm I'm the girl, I'm the Sunday girl where you, you want to look for lingerie, that that's my body. And so, but that's my bread and butter, right? Sure. And so my doctor knew that was my bread and butter. And so he, when he nicked a vein in my bone, I'm sure his thought was, I can't open her up. There goes her modeling career. So he, he tried to figure out where the source of the blood was coming from. And about 30 minutes into this, now blood is pooling inside. And then, you know, and so he has to now in an emergency cut me from hip to hip. So like he hasn't moved muscles. He hasn't gotten major things out of the way. He's like sliced me open trying to find the source. So I don't bleed to death on the table. Sure. And in surgery, I had a, in surgery, I had a blood transfusion. And then when I woke up from surgery, I was having my second blood transfusion because I'd lost so much blood. Um, he was actually a really kind doctor. And he came to my bedside the next morning and literally like threw himself on my bed and just was like, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, it was the kind of doctor where you, you trust him yeah. and you trust him for, you trust him because he's empathetic and compassionate. He did the best he could. It wasn't right. his fault. He made a mistake. But he came to me and was like, I don't, you know, he was humble, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remind me of that later when we talk about my. Uh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) And we're getting there. But but anyway, that kind of that threw me for about a year. It took me a long time for my red blood cells to replenish. And from that point, I had some other digestive issues, which were a complication to that because of the portion of the colon that took out, which was 28 inches. I was no longer able to digest sugar. Okay. There are certain parts of your colon that have digestive enzymes yeah. that have certain parts, certain foods. Well, the, the lower portion of my colon, they took out 28 inches. And that part, we need that part to di- have digestive enzymes for fructose, which is the formal word for sugar. Sure. And so I was no longer able to eat sugar. Now, I've figured out how to live life without sugar. And by the way, I kind of think it's a blessing now. Yeah. But for but for the year where they couldn't figure out why I was vomiting every time I ate, it took them about a year to figure out that I was allergic to sugar. And that was a very difficult year. So I was losing weight and I was trying to replenish. My body was trying to recover from the surgery, from the loss of blood. And now I'm vomiting all the time. They're tr- my body's trying to figure out like right. what's because so, you're eating, you're eating stuff that has sugar. I'm stuff with sugar. I'm having, yeah. a, I'm having a margarita and I'm vomiting and my doctors are like, Hmm, wow. you may have cancer. And I, I'm, and I'm 35 going, wait a minute. I'm a mother. I'm a model. I'm a self-proclaimed athlete. And now I'm what's happening to me. I know. Right. So that was my first brush with that. <laughs> okay. What, what year was that with the stomach uh, so, or the colon? So that was, Okay. So that, well, that was 16 years ago. So 2006. 2006. Okay. So you, we, we, you've been through that challenge. I figured it out. 2011 rolls around and the ligament in your right wrist is torn from wear and tear. I think you mentioned you did a lot of yoga and, you know, all those poses and everything. Okay. Yeah. Please tell our audience the story of your journey dealing with this. So it's interesting. My arm has been probably the biggest problem in my life. And I've had a lot of major other problems, which we'll talk about. I won't give it away yet. And so I went, I tore a ligament and I'm I'm a small boned person. And so through driving and laundry and yoga and yoga poses, you know, my, my wrist, I had a ligament that tore, not a big deal. But I had, I interviewed three different doctors and I picked the Stanford grad because, right, he's got the pedigree and he's young. And, and I think this is my guy. And he was was nice. Yeah. That was my choice. Right. And so I picked the Stanford guy and he did the surgery. And six weeks later, the cast comes off. And two days after the cast came off, my arm ballooned. Like it looked like my thigh bone. My, so my arm this is the fusion now, but so my arm literally looked like a thigh bone. Lynn Handelin is a new author who credits Anne Rice and her vampire books as his inspiration. For hardcore vampire fans, this dynamic, epic, paranormal romance novel titled The Darkest Gift, which took five and a half years to write and professionally edit, is a must read. 
The book showcases Jack, a gay man who struggles with his own sexual identity, meets elegant yet incredibly mysterious Laurent Richelieu. He thinks his stroke of bad luck with men and women has ended, or is it the beginning of a nightmare? As the two begin their courtship, Jack encounters horrifying experiences involving vampirism, paranormal experiences, and possible reincarnation, making him question his sanity. The more time Jack spends with his mysterious European love interest, Laurent, the more revealed about the dark secret awaiting Jack. Are they destined to be together? Does Laurent honestly care for Jack? Or is there a more sinister plot involved with the addition of two other vampires from Laurent's past, Stefan and Fabian? Can the help of a self-described voodoo high priestess from Haiti, Queen Raffaella, alter Jack's predestined future, or is his fate already sealed? The book takes place from 18th century Paris to the latter part of 20th century New Orleans and Haiti, where vampires become real and spirits appear, and where physical and spiritual love survives all odds and good engage evil in an unwinnable battle. The book is a breakthrough in featuring two vampires of the same gender as a couple. The author writes a compelling and enthralling book where the characters are complicated, both the humans and the vampires, and that the same-sex couples are far less ambiguous about their sexual orientation than in vampire books of the last century. Author Len Handelin is not limited to just writing about vampires. Len's second book, Requiem for Miriam, is a murder crime drama with paranormal activities set in Manhattan, Westchester County, and Mexico in the 1980s, and is set to be released by the end of January, beginning of February 2022. The Darkest Gift is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books a Million in hardcover, paperback, and ebook versions. The ebook version has done over 2,000 downloads in just two months. This book would make a great holiday gift. The book information will be listed in the podcast notes and featured on the podcast Facebook page and podcast website under the sponsor tab. And I was taught, right, let's go back to the modeling and let's go back to the generational burden, which I think was what happened to me. I was taught to stay in my lane. As a woman, I was taught to, you know, respect authority. Yeah. I was taught to respect police, doctors, like normal. I think not, not too many questions, in other words. Don't ask questions. Yeah. Don't ask questions, yeah. especially with authority. And, and so when I called that doctor, it was a Sunday and I already felt shame because again, my self-esteem was zero and I didn't know it. And I already felt shame by calling him and putting him out because yeah. I was having this major health issue. Like I was burdening him. So that's where my head was, right? Sure. Yeah. And, and so he told me that I over iced my arm. And so I believed him because I didn't have a medical degree. Right. <laughs> I, did, I didn't go to medical school. You didn't go to Stanford. <laughs> I didn't go to Stanford. And so I was like, okay, I took the ice off. And a couple days later, I still couldn't get out of bed. I would carry my arm like on my chest, like a child. And if I had to get out of my bed to go to the bathroom, the pain would be tr so tremendous. I would be, my whole body would shake. And so the pain was grotesque. And I had already known pain because yeah. of my whole section. So I yeah. knew pain was sure so when i say that the pain was grotesque it was grotesque and so i went to see the doctor again and that time he didn't see me he sent me to his physical therapist because he wouldn't see me and so his physical therapist said i had done too many exercises with my wrist and so she splinted it and she sent me home and if i can describe what i looked like walking out of his office it almost looked like i was a dog with a leash like being dragged because I was so afraid to leave his office in the pain that I was in, but I was too afraid to ask him, wait, I think this is, there's something really wrong. And so about a week, so I spent the next week in my bed. I stopped eating, I stopped drinking any water because I didn't want to get out of bed to use the restroom. Now uh -oh. I, have two, I have two young kids. Yeah. Forget trying to take care of them. I have this, I have this, you know, pain, this arm, this swollen arm on my chest and I can't move. And so about a week later, I went back to the same doctor because that's the one who did the surgery. And I said, this is a real problem. And this is what's happening to me. 
And he said, oh gosh, I can't believe this is happening, but you have this condition called RSD. It's your brain is telling your limb, which in my case was my right arm, yeah. that, there's, that there's pain and swelling, but there's really not. So I'm going to send you down to the first floor to a pain management doctor and let's get her opinion okay. and, let's, and she's going to give you pain medication. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I got this thing called RSD. So what do I do? I go down to the pain management doctor. She concurs with his diagnosis. So now I have two doctors who said, this is what I have. Right. And so you, you have a concurring diagnosis. So yeah. You have believe. Have. Yeah. So she puts me on massive pain medication, which I start to take, but then that causes other problems. Right. Sure. So it yeah. causes intestinal issues. And I'm, and I'm like, I can't function. I can't be a mother. I can't drive my kids on this kind of medication. So I stopped taking the medication altogether. And then about a week after that, my arm's still swelling. The doctor, go back to the doctor and he says, I need to do a nerve block in your neck. So we're basically going to block the pain and the swelling that your brain is telling you that you have, and it will cause the swelling to go down. I'm like, okay, desperate. Well, Des anything, anything to stop anything. the pain. I mean, anything. Yeah. So I was desperate. And so he did the he did the surgery, which by the way, has complications. It can have complications. If you miss the nerve, you can be permanently paralyzed. A lot of complications and yeah. it's anesthesia. Yeah. And so I, he does the nerve block. It doesn't help at all. So he says, we'll do another one a week later. And here I am like this little puppy, like whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Yeah. I'm just falling in line. And all of this stuff starts to add up. So I go to the second one and the second nerve block ends up taking some of the swelling away. So he's like, see, I was right. You have RSD. Now I'm going to send you to a physical therapist far away from my office. He doesn't say far away, but looking back, it's so obvious. I'm going to send you away from my office. So I get you out of my building yeah. and you're going to go to physical therapy for six months because RSD essentially will lock up whatever joint is the problem. And for me, it was my right wrist. And so you have, these were my fighting orders. You have six months to get any movement in your wrist. And once six months is up, that's it. Wow. So, so fight hard. I have a really type A personality and I'm like, oh, I'm going to fight hard. I'm yeah. going to get as much movement in my wrist as possible. I want to go back to yoga. I don't want to be handicapped, blah, blah, blah. Like these things are going on in my mind. Sure. My mind. But in the meantime, I'm in excruciating pain. So I start this relationship with this physical therapist who is helping me get into these appointments. I'm going on my birthday. I'm going on Christmas Eve. I'm going on my son's birthday. So for the next several months, I'm going to physical therapy. And while I'm in physical therapy, I'm in excruciating pain. I mean, they're hooking up my wrist to electricity to move it. But slowly but surely, each day that passes, my, my wrist is locking up. And so in my brain, I'm thinking, oh, well, he's right. This is RSD. My, my, my wrist is blocking. Ultimately, because we could talk all day about this. There were some things that happened. The doctor started to bully me. The doctor told me that what, what, uh, my, my incisions from October, now this is like February, one piece of metal popped out of the incision. The incision wasn't closing. And that's like wow. a red flag. That, yeah. That's like the red flag. Okay, infection, infection. And I sent him an email saying a piece of metal came out of my wrist. This is a picture of it. And he emailed me back saying, how do I know you didn't take that picture on the arm of an airplane? That's, that's, that's what his email said. That's unbelievable. That he so, he's bullying, so he's bullying me and I don't even realize it. And so I, looking back, it's so obvious, right? right. But and the other thing about massive pain is that when you're in intensive pain, the only things you remember are the things that are most important. Sure. And the, the things that were most important to me were my children. And so I'm doing my best to try to take care of my children and everything else is a blur because I'm just trying to get through the day in this pain. So I start to kind of get a clue that this guy may be bullying me. And about 30 days after that, so now another 30 days, I finally get up enough courage and say to my husband, I need to see another doctor. Because in the meantime, this, this doctor from Stanford had said, you don't need to see another doctor. You're fine. The surgery went fine. You're, he, he called me a hysterical housewife. Wow. So again, and I'm thinking to myself, am I a hysterical housewife? Am I making this up? Is this in my head? Right. These are questions that I'm asking. Sure. And so ultimately I, I went to see a second opinion and the man took one x-ray. That was it. And he came back into the room and he was pasty white, his whole wow. face, like a ghost. 
And he said to me, every wrist, every bone in your wrist is broken and there's no cartilage left, which means you have a bone infection and we're going to get you in surgery right now. Wow. And so I called and got my kids, you know, play dates after school. Cause I was going into surgery and he went in and he dug out as much infection as he could and he closed it up. And he basically said to me, these are your choices. Your wrist is destroyed. I would suggest you go to New York to this place called HSS. It's, it's a, it's the best orthopedic hospital in the country and see if they can do something. And so I flew up to New York and I found a really compassionate doctor who would take my botched arm, right? Cause a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors won't take other doctors botched work right. because it's like a liability. So he took the job and he said, you have to have a full fusion, which means you have no function in your wrist. And he did, he fused my arm. He put a cadaver, he put, he took my bones out that were destroyed. Yeah. He put a, he put a cadaver bone and a cadaver Achilles tendon and cadaver grafts and took my wrist out and I don't have a wrist. So my arm is fused. So like, I don't, I have no, I don't have a wrist. They just formed it. That looks like, so you can see it. Yeah. They, they formed it to look like a wrist, but there's no function. And so I became permanently handicapped immediately. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> we'll get to the next part of the story. Yeah. So uh, right around the time of your six week post fusion checkup, now you're age 41, right. you discover a lump in your left breast. Would you please uh, share with us the story surrounding how you found out you had breast cancer? So I was in New York for my post. I was living in Dallas. So I was in, I flew up to New York for my six week post arm fusion appointment. And I'm in a cast from my fingertips to my shoulder. Yeah. So I, so I go, I'm staying at a hotel and for the past seven or eight months that I had casts on before my arm was fused and right when my arm was fused. I would just get in the shower and I'd pour liquid soap over my shoulder and just let it wash down my body because I had these casts on. So my sure. arm was out of the shower. Yeah. It's difficult to do to shower. It was so difficult. So I would just use liquid soap. I pour it. So I'm yeah. in this, ho- I'm in this hotel and I call down on the front desk and I say, I need some liquid soap. And they're like, yeah, right. Whatever. Use the bar of soap that's in your shower. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. So I've got this huge heavy cast outside of the shower and I'm trying to fumble with this bar of soap, which I dropped a couple of times, right? Yeah, and hey, that I'm, happens I'm, to everybody. I'm trying to get down, you know, with this cast and I'm, it's out of the shower and I'm reaching down and getting this bar of soap and I'm like, trying to, ro- trying to wash. And I felt a lump immediately. Like it was, oh my God. <laughs> so maybe it's, a, maybe it's a good thing that they didn't bring up that liquid soap. Literally. Right? It's, literally. It's yeah. so, it's, it's incredible how that happened. And, and what a sad story, but also really powerful. And so five days later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in aggressive form. Now I have no family history of cancer. I have no family history of breast cancer. And I have, I do not have the breast cancer gene. So now I have gone from being literally a thriving mother, wife, social light model to a sickly woman needing constant care and attention who was now about to face 28 rounds of chemotherapy and who knew how many surgeries. Right. Right. And so I, so I go meet with an oncologist and now I have no faith in the medical system. I'm like, doctors are liars. Absolutely. I can't, tr- I can't trust anybody. I'm certainly not going to trust a doctor. So I immediately walk into this oncologist's office and the guy was so kind. And he said to me, I know about you. I heard about you let me see your fused arm. And so immediately he's like trying to soften me. Right. You made a connection. He made the connection. Yeah. And he, so I started to kind of allow him into my life. Yeah. He, he ended up becoming an amazing doctor and I really trust him. Um, But we had to postpone chemotherapy for 30 days. Now, when you are diagnosed with cancer, the first thing you want to do is get out of you. Right. That's well, we, we, we share, we share something. I had male, I had male breast cancer. I had no, no gene mutations or, right. or, or anything like that. So I, I know what you're going, I know what you went through. Right. And, exactly. you know, so, so, yeah. And, and the first thing is you see this, you know, you got this growth in you, you right. want to get it out. You know, that's the first thing. And exactly. of course, 
they don't schedule surgery the next day. You have to wait and you're sitting there. Yeah, it's, it's tough knowing that you have this, this growth yeah. in your body and you want to, you know, you keep, they're Thanks not taking that. it out. Yeah. It's, it's so bad. So they, well, post, then, they postpone it for 30 days be, yeah, because, because of they, what? The fusion? They said the grafts, the bone grafts would dissolve. It would destroy the grafts. The chemo. Yeah. 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 Wow. So I'm like, am I ever going to get rid of this doc, this old doctor and this arm situation? Right. It was tr- it, terrible. Anyway. So, so you lose trust in the medical field and, and everything in general. And uh, you face some despair yeah. and the thought of, uh, of taking your life, you wanted to quit. What, what was your thought process? I know there was a thought process. You were waiting for your son to, to come home from school. Yeah. So I just decided that, listen, I wasn't sure I was going to make it through the 28 rounds of chemo right. and at that point, at that point in my head, because my self-esteem was so low, I thought nobody's going to show up for me. All my friends and family have just used their time, the resources to help me through the arm. And yeah. now I'm this huge burden. And now they, now I'm going to have to ask people, which by the way, it was so hard for me because my pride and my ego was getting in the way. I was too ashamed to ask for help. And I was like, not only can I not ask for help, I can't expect it. Cause why would they show up for me? I'm going to lose my looks, all the value that I felt that I had in society, which was the external External. was was about to be completely gone. Right. So game over for my value and my worth in society was now going to be nothing. That's yeah. what I thought. Sure. That's what I, and so it's because I was dependent on my, my external for 41 years. And so my, I said, to, I started to tell my friends and family, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to get through the chemotherapy anyway. So I'm going to take myself out of the equation now because I don't want you guys to continue to be burdened. I don't want my kids to continue to be burdened. I want, you know, I, you guys will get over it. You know, I, I just, I, in my mind, it wasn't rational, but I was rationalizing it, right? Yeah. When, when you go through trauma after trauma after trauma, you don't think clearly. Right. And so I thought it was normal. I thought what I was, my decision making was normal and logical, and it wasn't. Thankfully, um, I was waiting for my son to come home from boarding school to say goodbye. I wasn't going to tell him I was taking my life, but I was just going to say, I love you. I'm proud of you. All those things before sure. I was going to take my life. And then he got delayed from coming home because he got in trouble at school. And then in the meantime, my friends and my family were pouring into me. They were saying that my value was not dependent on my external and that my life was worth saving. And at some point, my story would be able to help other people until I believed in myself. They were going to stand rooted as the hands and feet for me. Awesome. And, And I was like, I didn't really believe them. And then they started to tell me that it would be a privilege to stand with me and a privilege to walk through this season with me. And I was like, really? Like you just walked through this other season with me. Now you're going to walk through this with me. And they said, it doesn't matter the season, whether it's good, bad, ugly, or tragic or muddy, we're still going to walk with you. And that for me was so confusing because I had lived this transactional life and I wasn't able to do anything for them. And so my, my thought process start process started to shift and I thought, huh, they keep showing up. So the next weekend, my son got delayed again. And in the meantime, my friends are showing up every single day and not just one or two, a lot. That's good. And and so by the time my, my son came home, my friends had convinced me that my life was worth saving. And I started to believe it myself. And so that's when I started to fight for my life. And that's when I started to chemo. And I was like, you know what? I'm all in. And my, and my value doesn't depend on what I look like, but I have to figure out what my value is. I have to do a lot of introspection, which by the way, took me the full 15 months of chemotherapy to figure out. It wasn't like overnight doing a lot of introspection and a lot of self-esteem work takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. And there was a ton of waiting time, right? You're waiting at chemo, you're waiting during chemo. Yeah. You're waiting for surgeries. You're recovering from surgeries. There's a lot of alone time. And I took that time to try to figure out who I am. What am I about? What do I want to, how do I want to live moving forward? If tomorrow isn't promised to anybody, how do I want to live today? So you're going through the 28 rounds, the 15 months of chemo, what shifted in your persona to get rid of the why me attitude to the why not me attitude? 
and get rid of all that anger and all that past baggage. And I did have a lot of that. <laughs> I had a lot of unfor- had a lot of unforgiveness for myself first, and also for the doctor. And I did feel like a victim for a long time, and that wasn't getting me anywhere. That that really was just keeping me stuck and paralyzed in this discomfort, in this hostility, in this anger. And I thought, what would it look like if I gave that up? What would it look like if I wasn't dependent on my looks? And what I found was my load was lightened. You know, the the backpack that I carried of like life was supposed to be this way. And I was supposed to end up here or there. All All those assumptions or expectations, they went out the window. And so, but I had a choice of how I was going to live during this season of my life. And I was modeling, what was I going to model to my kids? Was I going to model courage or was I going to model pity? Right. Right. And I I looked around and I saw my contemporaries who were my friends who we were all young and none of us had seen anything like this. And they were watching me to see how I was going to respond. And on the days that I responded out of a victim mode, not only was it difficult for them and it kind of put a, 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 you know, kind of a pressure between us, but it was, my life was very unhappy. And so when I started to like, stop doing that, yeah. my through faith and friendship and people showing up and pouring into faith and learning about faith and learning about trust again, then all of that started to kind of wash away. And I wasn't meditating on the outcome. I was meditating on the day. And so again, I didn't know if I was going to survive breast cancer, but that wasn't what I was focused on. What I was focused on was I'm going to do my best today and I'm going to show courage and I'm going to give myself the respect to show courage. And I'm going to give myself the respect to forgive these people because they don't, I don't owe them anything. And I don't want them to continue to control my life. You know, that anger and that bitterness to the doctor was controlling my life. And why would I want to give him the control? Right. 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 Get, get rid of them. Tell us, tell us who you are uh, most grateful to that helped you learn to cope and heal. I had a really good solid group of women who stood by me and they, they poured into me with their faith. And I, I was always, I always, I grew up Catholic. I was always had faith. I, I knew God, but I wasn't, if, if a Bible study got in the way of my yoga class, I took the yoga class and not the Bible study. Yeah. And that shifted. Yeah. And it was more important for me to go to the Bible study than the yoga class. Because after facing all these illnesses, I was like, oh my gosh, I can be totally rooted in the world's view and culture and society and things and the bags and the, the stuff. But gosh, we can't take it with us. What a bummer. Like I, I tried to fill myself up with all that stuff and it didn't work. Yeah. I tried really hard. And when I realized there was no U-Haul behind the hearse and we can't take it with us, I was like, well, then why do I even need it? You know, let's just give it away. Yeah. And so I think that my friends who kept saying, we're not going to forsake you. God won't forsake you. They're the ones that showed me what really showing up looked like. And not only was I able to show up for other people because of what they modeled, but I was able to show up for myself. It's amazing uh, when you're going through that journey and I went through the same journey, how, how many people come out of the woodwork, you know, to help. Yeah. You don't you really have to appreciate want, those people, but they want to, they want to. Yeah. Oh, definitely. To. Yeah. Now if your cancer had a message for you, what do you think it would say? You know, I loved who I was before I had all these illnesses, but I, I really love who I am. I'm very different in that. Um, my focus is different. And I went from being very self-involved and not just because of my career, but also because of the choices I made and to being very selfless. And I'm not on this podcast. I don't do social media because of some sort of self-promotion. Right. I want, I I like people to read my book because it's helped thousands of people. You want to help people. My life is about serving. It's not about self-promotion. And so at the end of every day, I know that I have a pure heart. I know that what I'm doing is out of love for other people. And if I get diagnosed with cancer again at some point or tomorrow, I'm good because I know what I've done my job. And my job wasn't to look pretty. My job wasn't to buy expensive bags. My job was to serve other people. And so the biggest difference between my life pre-41 and now is that. 
At what point in time, uh, Christine, did you resume normal activities? And, and how are you feeling today? As of today, are you having any issues with pain or how are you doing? Yes, yeah, so I never really resume normal activities because I have a fused arm. And I'm, I have been in chronic pain for 10 years, meaning I, I don't take pain medication, but the chronic pain, you know, I, I get really like, I, I grind my teeth and, you know, it comes out. Right. Yeah. Um, and it could come out in ways that I wouldn't want it to come out, like out of anger, bitterness and all those things. I, it doesn't come out like that. It almost few, the chronic pain almost fuels me to do more and more to help other people. So their self-esteem isn't as low as mine was not now <laughs> my self-esteem is unshakable, but, and so their self-esteem isn't cratered and crumbled because if you're rooted in, you know, what this world will give you or accolades from society or the modeling career, or like I said, materialism, yeah. you're going to have some really strong falls. Sure. But if, but if you're rooted in self-assurance and self-esteem and faith and whatever your faith looks like, if you're rooted in that, you're on solid ground. And so I need to be, a, I, I need, I work on my self-esteem every day and I try to help people with their self-esteem every day, because if your self-esteem isn't strong, the choices that you make are, will determine the future of your life. And that, that can be kind of scary. Yeah. Very good advice. Would you please, uh, tell us about your nonprofit work that you do? Uh, I know you're involved with ebeauty.com, uh, learn, look, locate, and people of purpose. So like I said, I mean, it's all about serving. And so if I can serve on these boards, which gives me great joy and also helps other people, like that's a win-win. So eBeauty is an incredible organization. When I was diagnosed with cancer and lost my hair, I was able to buy wigs and I was able to look in the mirror and, and kind of resemble myself, right? Yeah, sure. In fact, when my kids, when my kids were around, they really wanted me to look like their mom. And so if I wore like a bandana or if I didn't wear anything on my head, it really upset them. Okay. So, having, so having a blonde wig was important for them. But I also had the ability to afford one. A lot of women, more women than you can imagine, can't afford a wig. And so eBeauty distributes free wigs. And so we've partnered with L'Oreal, who gives us grant money. And we partnered with Paul Mitchell Salons, which that their salons wash and style our wigs. And to date, we have redistributed over 55,000 free wigs to women all over the country. That's amazing. So that's one of the boards that I serve on. And then I also serve on people of purpose. I've had the great fortune of being able to speak as a motivational speaker in prisons in Florida. And I spoke in a prison about four and a half years ago. And I met this gentleman who'd been in pr the prison system for about 30 years. Well, since that time, he got out of prison about three years ago and he reached out to me on social media and he said, you know, can we meet and, you know, let's meet for lunch. And I want to talk about this nonprofit. I want to start. I want to change the landscape of recidivism in Palm Beach County. And I thought, well, why not? Right. Go meet with him. So I went and had lunch with him. And since then, we've created this organization, him, he and I together, and we've created people of purpose in Palm Beach County. And we have raised money and we have compiled this amazing board of people who are so passionate about helping these inmates that come out. Um, we help with paying their fines. We help to equip them, not by feeding them fish, but teaching them how to fish. And so we're trying to change the rate of recidivism in Palm Beach County. And that's people of purpose. Great, uh, that, that's fantastic work that you're doing. How have all these experiences led you to bring goodness to the world by helping others out? They're going through their challenges. And what, what, what was the catalyst that prompted you to use your story to be more public and vulnerable to help others? What, what, what sparked that? Um, I, you know, I, it's funny because going b way back to when I started modeling, I always wanted to write. So even as a child, I'd write these little short stories and I'd put them under my bed because I didn't want anybody to read them. But inside my head, there was always a dream of mine to write a book. And so after chemotherapy, I thought, wow, I mean, there's been a lot of trauma for one person at a young age. And so I, I decided that I was going to write a book about it. 
And I almost gave it to God and just said, okay, you know what, if you want this out there, if I can be a service to other people, get the book out there. And it became a best, it became a bestseller and the book went out there. Walk and, beside me, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was also very vulnerable in sharing the story, meaning I didn't just write, it wasn't a self-help book. It's a, it's a story. It's a novel. It's a fictional depiction of my life. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that was really important because when I was going through breast cancer, there wasn't a book like this. There were self-help books. There were spiritual books. There were a lot of different types of books like that, but there wasn't a story. Like I wanted to read about what does chemo do? And, you know, what does it look like for people to show up? But what are the bad days? What does that look like? And so I wrote the story and it's, it's become very popular, but more importantly, I think it's because of the vulnerability. You know, people like to read stories and hear about stories that touch their lives yeah. to make them not feel alone, right? Right. That's and what this so, podcast is all about. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you're doing it, right? You, you, I'm, you I'm trying. It. Yeah. Right. And so that was the that was the propeller, right? And then after that, I became a motivational speaker. And then I have I started a new career. And just recently, about a year and a half ago, I started I went back to the modeling industry. So I do model. It's not my bread and butter, but I do love to be in that space because it feels yeah. a little bit like yeah. home to me. Sure. So I do a lot of different things. So what misconceptions or myths uh, do people have about fighting cancer that you would like to dispel? Well, I, there, I've been a fair amount of people have called me a cancer disruptor because I do like to talk about the complications. I think a lot of people just assume that when you're classified, labeled cancer-free, that the complications go away. That's not true at all. I, after my chemotherapy, I lost three teeth because they destroyed my yeah, teeth, yeah. chemotherapy. I have liver damage. I have heart issues. And I mean, I was a really healthy person. Sure. And so, to, so from the chemotherapy, all of these things happened to me. And so like, for instance, I was, I had an eye minor surgery this morning because I, there are chemo induced cataracts. And so I got two cataracts from chemotherapy. Yeah. So the list, goes, the list goes on and on. Oh yeah. And so, so I think that but you know, when you're going through treatment and you're going through radiation, you're going through chemotherapy, you're going through mastectomies or whatever surgeries you're having, and it's not exclusive to breast cancer, but any cancer, Yeah. people show up, but it's these things that happen like this morning with my eye surgery where there's nobody showing up and it's not because they wouldn't, but I think that people just think, oh, you're fine now. You're good. When we're not really that good. <laughs> yeah, when, once you have once you have it, it, it it's it's for life, and you know, I, I, there's always the recurrence factor, of course. Uh, but I try not to think about it. Well, I don't want to live my life in fear, and I don't. Yeah. And one of the reasons how I don't live in fear is that I know that every single day that I'm serving and I'm helping other people, and if at the end of my time I get cancer back, whenever that is, I know I'm good meaning I've done everything I can for humanity in my way. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, let's go back to self-esteem. There was a huge portion of my life where I felt like I didn't have a voice. And it wasn't that I sought out to have a voice when I wrote the book or to do these interviews, podcasts and things like that. It wasn't because I was like, Oh, you know, I deserve a voice. It was because I knew I had a story that could help other people. And I became that voice. And so at the end of the day, whatever the outcome is, which I'm not focused on, right? I'm not focused as how long am I going to live? I'm not focused on whether I'm going to get cancer back. I'm focused on today. What can I do today to help other people? And yeah. that takes the fear away. Are you planning on writing another book in the future? I did write another book. I'm actually, I actually, um, I'm, a, I'm in the graduate program at Harvard right now. Speaking of Ivy League schools. Yeah. Um, I Congratulations. Do, I, thank you. I'm getting my master's degree right now in uh, creative writing and literature. And so I did write another book about four years ago. Um, but now that I'm, I've been in the master's program for about a year and a half. And ever since I started school, I realized how much it takes to be a really good writer, a better writer. Yeah. And so you know, I'm going to redo my second book before I publish it. Christine, what excites you going forward in your work to help others? I think the most exciting 
thing for me on a day to day basis is just to see how I can lighten other people's. Yeah, I think I can. I think the most. I think the most incredible gift that I can give to other people is to lighten their load, to teach them about self esteem and why it's so critical, and to share my story as in you know a relatability. Yeah. And because I think that so often we're labeled just by the exterior, right? People look at you and they would never know you had cancer. People look at me and go, oh yeah, she's, she doesn't look like she was ever sick. Yeah. But that's not true. And so I think we need, I, I love talking about labeling and not labeling and not judging because you just don't know what people go through. And so the more I can, the bigger voice I have, the more I think I can help other people. And so that gives me, that gives me joy by lightening other people's load. Probably takes a little bit of that pain away too. You know what? I, that's true because I do live in chronic pain. And if I can teach people like stand up for yourself, don't listen to those types of bullies. Don't allow people to say those things about you or to question your own mind. Then I know I've helped somebody down the road by not putting them in the position of a fused arm. That's the way I feel. You know, even if I can help one person out there, absolutely, I'm happy with that. Christine, what is your takeaway message to all those facing an up, uphill challenge in their life? Um, I think for I think the greatest gift that I've been given is the gift of faith and the gift of people showing up. And so, if I can teach people what showing up really looks like. And that's season after season. And it, it, whether it's muddy or glamorous, you got to stick with people and yeah. that changes and saves lives. And so my best advice is find true friends, tr find your true tribe before illness or trauma happens and pour into them as well, because you can't have good friends without being a good friend. And so if you have a solid group of people around you, you can get through anything. Good advice. Christine, how can people contact you? Well, uh, my website is christinehandy.com. I'm also on social media platforms. My Instagram is christinehandy1. And I'm on Pinterest, Christine Handy. <laughs> I'm on, I'm, I'm kind of on all the platforms. If you just Google Christine Handy, I'm out there. You're out there, um, okay. And, and my, my book, Walk Beside Me, is sold in most bookstores. Walk Beside Me. I'm going to include all that information in the podcast notes. Uh, Christine, you are a, a true model for us. And I am not referring to the fashion model type. Your story uh, is awe-inspiring, and we can all use the knowledge you learned and shared with us from your difficult journey to give hope and inspiration to others. Your courage, your bravery, and passion to help others is so evident talking with you. Thank you once again for sharing your story, and God bless you and your family going forward. Comments and suggestions to improve the podcast are always welcome. Uh, you can email us at it's a wrap with rap at gmail.com. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. You can sign up for our newsletter. Facebook, it's a wrap with rap. YouTube, it's a wrap with rap, the podcast uncut. And we are on Instagram, it's a wrap with rap. Thanks everyone for listening. Please stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap. <laughs>